My name is Jenny Western. I'm a curator and writer based in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and I am here to introduce uh, an exhibition called Former, which is at the Manitoba Craft Council in their Shirley Richardson Craft Gallery. It's running here in Winnipeg from May 7th to June 26th of 2021. And I'm here speaking with the artist behind this exhibition, Carissa Bacte, and we're gonna talk about the works in the show, have a conversation, um, and just generally chew the fat about this incredible work that she's made that's on display here during these strange times in which we live where someone in Winnipeg can speak with someone in Iceland about a show <laughs> way yeah. down in downtown Winnipeg. So I'm super excited to be here. Carissa, I'm going to let you maybe give a brief introduction to yourself and who you are for everyone watching. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jenny. So my name is Carissa Bacte. I'm an artist, sculptor, designer, human right now stationed in Reykjavik, Iceland, uh, but I split my time between Alberta and Iceland normally. Um, I'm, I guess, a glass blower at heart, but I work sculpturally in so many materials, sort of depending on where I am, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, and, you know, where I am in the world. Um, so this work is a combination of two materials that I have fell in love with. First of all, blown glass and then Icelandic horsehair. Um, so I started working with Icelandic horsehair in about 2016 when I came for a residency here in Iceland. And uh, at the time I was making a ton of work in, or most of my practice was glass threads sort of fiber optic glass or using glass as a soft sculptural material. So when I came to Iceland, I definitely was searching for a material proxy for these glass threads. And I found that in Icelandic horsehair. Um, it was really interesting to me because, you know, the one of the first things that I noticed coming to Iceland, I had been visiting for a few years at that point, but uh, was the number of horses here, you know, and I, I knew that they ate horse. so. I always wondered, you know, what happens to the rest of it. You know, I think hair is this interesting thing that I had worked with previously in my practice, um, where it's like a supercharged material with all sorts of like value systems attached to it at sort of, depending on what lifespan it's in or where it is. Um, so that's what led me to using horse hair in Iceland. And then I guess it seemed natural to me to combine it with glass um, and instead of glass thread more as like glass as a vessel as I sort of traditionally learned it in art school I think that's what you kind of learn in glass making school principally as a glass blower is vessel making and then you sort of branch out from there. It's so interesting to think of a vessel in terms of this horse hair like when I was looking at the pieces and trying to think about them um, it's so easy to sort of um, see them in terms of human hair and the way that we style human hair. And I look at this piece in particular, and to me, it's just these like two long pigtails hanging down the wall. And the glass operates almost like a, the way a ribbon or an elastic would to tie it together. And it's interesting to think about the role of, of a vessel in forming and shaping, well, in forming the contents of it. Mm -hmm. um, this piece in particular also is so stunningly beautiful. The image on the left is um, the photo that you sent of how you have installed it in the past. And the photo on the right is the way that we ended up installing it uh, here in Winnipeg at the Craft Council. Um, it's so interesting too to see the way that the form of the piece changes on how it's installed and where it's installed. Um, and this, I also think this is sort of like the most eye-catching, it's sort of the biggest, longest piece in the show. And sort of um, the most ambitious. I, I don't want to say that though, because they're all quite <laughs> ambitious. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, it definitely, it was the most time consuming. So like I blow the glass and I generally blow a bunch of shapes and I cold work them as sort of, templates that I'm going to use at a later date. Um, so I had already had the, the glass piece made, but the horse hair takes a long time to get into this refined state. So I go to the slaughterhouse and I buy the horse tails as they've been cut off the horse after slaughter. 
and it has the whole spine or most of the spine still on it. Um, so then at that point, I usually take them to the sea and cut out all they've like got preserving salt, salt to preserve it on, on the tails. So I cut the tail hair from the meat. And then at that point I start washing it. And it's usually a process. First I do it in the sea to remove, you know, the major residue on it, horse residue, I guess. Um, and then I take it to a river and thing like all natural soap. I wash it a few times there. And then it's sort of at a, a state where I'm comfortable bringing it into my bathtub and I use, you know, kind of fancy horse shampoos and conditioners and things. And I really spend a lot of time. I mean, but by the time I even start, you know, working with them in the first portion of it, I've washed them maybe six to 10 times. And then I say I have to clean them. So that's sort of brushing, straightening and separating different lengths of hair that were all within that same tail. And from that point, I do a whole other process to either sew them together or glue them together with carotene glues uh, to make something like this. So this piece probably took about four months in total to make. So, yeah, and it was really important for this one. You know, I think I, I think most of my work is very unimportantly biograph autobiographical, really. Um, but for me, this I was thinking so much about my time as like a hairstylist and a hairstylist apprentice. It was my first job. And I remember like just being obsessed with blonde. And so for me, the size of this piece really had like this connection to myself. And it was important that it was like extravagant and large, as big as life size um, for this beautiful white blonde tail, tail hair. Extravagant and large, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's when, and I'm losing my, my words here, but as you say, like, like life size, yeah, when you approach it, the scale is so close to human, as we'll see the other works, many of the other works in the show are quite small or diminutive or more hand sized. And this one is just like your body is interacting with it because it is so long and and in the case here in Winnipeg we did hang it so high so you really have to approach it with your body and I think that's interesting too that you can kind of perceive it from far back as something and then when you come up close to it there's all these other details that you can perceive as well. I love the, the mystery of the names too so yeah you don't have to reveal too much I feel like it it lends to the sort of like um mythical quality that I find in this work that you're it's like you're revealing pieces from a fairy tale story that these are drawn from and the name and the works themselves are kind of getting our imaginations flowing in that direction and I love that I really appreciate that we get to see the detail on this one as well and hopefully everyone can sort of see that the the hair changes color, right? From the top mm -hmm. to the bottom. Um, yeah. Because that I found that really striking about this piece. Yeah, uh, this one was dyed with hibiscus, I guess what is supposed to be a, a weight loss or can be used as, as a weight loss tea. And this one's pretty precariously um, pinned on there. It's also only sewn, um, so kind of as you perhaps as you move through the space or as the piece lives its life, it's kind of losing the hair as well, or the hair changes shape or. It's stunning. Um, and the pink too, like the pink from the hibiscus going into mm -hmm. the hair and then the pink of um, the linen background. The show is fairly, um, monochromatic or kind of grayscale. There's a lot of whites, a lot of blacks, a little bit of brown, but there's this pop of pink every now and again that we'll see in a few of the pieces, including this one, um, because of the hibiscus and because of the linen. Is there anything you want to say about your use of pink in this body of work? <laughs> yeah, well, uh, if you can't tell, I love pink. Um, and I only started admitting it actually recently, not that I wouldn't admit it before, I started embracing it more recently. Um, and I think it really started to come out in my work during the pandemic in this like search for or embracing like this tenderness and maybe innocence 
Um, you know, in this time of like being cozy and feeling very vul vulnerable, I felt a lot more of a connection to the color and like the use of it in my work as I was doing these very nurturing uh, processes of like taking care of the hair and sort of rejuvenating it into this beautiful state. And I think, as you mentioned before, you know, the scale of the works changes. And I think that's something that as well happened um, during 2020, where I started to, like you had mentioned, work on a much more handheld scale or a more intimate scale. I felt this like drawing in it's happening. Mm -hmm. This one I felt like when I saw it, it reminded me of stories about trolls that I've heard about in Iceland. <laughs> because here in Manitoba, of course, we have our Icelandic community up in Gimli. And when you go up there, like troll culture seems to be very pervasive. And there was something about this piece, which I read as like a very, um, <laughs> very clean side, middle part and the hair hanging down in sort of a fierce manner. And again, my imagination just starts running with like, what is the story behind this? What does between both mean? And what's the story that Carissa is trying to get us on here? Or, you know, to give us pieces of where our own imaginings might take us. It's a super intriguing piece and it's in its simplicity. I love it. So please, anything you can share about this piece. Yeah, so this is like the second, Second edition of a piece I did in 2016 for my thesis show, which was two uh, plaster backs that were sort of a uh, man and a woman of the very similar build, and they were uh, installed against a wall uh, in Portugal, but very tied up against the wall so that they were maybe almost growing out of the wall, but you couldn't tell, you know, if they were growing out or if they were supposed to be there on surf bulb in the paint. Um, so this started with that sort of same idea of two things that are pretty similar, but maybe quite different. And if our ideas of things growing together or pulling apart or growing apart or pulling together um, and th these things that happen, I guess, all around us, but especially with human contact, um, it wasn't meant to look as creepy as it does but with most of my work I like have this idea and then through the process it becomes a totally different thing it becomes I guess what it's supposed to be um, and I was really happy with that as well but it definitely references you know a human and I think even if you didn't understand the pulling together or pulling apart I think that for me it's just important that there's some sort of interesting emotive experience that comes from this like this idea of a troll or somebody with their head hanging down or uh, yeah I don't know two different ponytails sort of referencing a body. Mm -hmm. It's great. I, yeah, there's that creepy aspect, but it's so alluring. You really do want to come in and again, look at these details close up and get a better idea of what it is. Do you find when people see your work, do they immediately know what the materials are that you're using? No, and that's actually interests me throughout my practice. Like I'm, I'm really interested in creating work that surprises people and really surprises myself um, with the reality, you know? So I think in a piece like this, you know, it looks like a soft drawing or you can understand that there's softness to the bottom part, but then the, the top part is so striking or linear and firm. So it becomes this other thing. And I think both the horse hair and the, the glass thread that I work in has that sort of play of being on the cusp of recognizability for our understanding of a material. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as a curator, in my mind's eye, I saw these in relationship to each other. And we talked about that when we talked about um, layout and floor plan ideas. Um, and you, at the time, you referenced some of these works that were stretched uh, on forms being sort of like paintings. Um, can you talk about that idea a little bit? I've always called these horsehair paintings and I'm not sure why. I think there's of course this like embedded hierarchy of art that happens that we learn about through the history of art, you know, as makers. Um, so I always consider something, you know, that's another material perhaps put on top of a canvas and displayed that way it could be a painting maybe it doesn't have to be made out of paint. And I think also you're learning different languages, Portuguese and I different 
numbers and nouns for the processes that we use and take for granted. So I think that also op opens my eyes to the possibility of understanding materials and techniques and works differently. Um, so this really was an experiment in the materiality of, of horse hair. And I was really specifically interested um, in landscape paintings when I made this. This one kind of completes that foursome that we put together because it's just similar enough and different enough um, within that relationship to the other three that we've just seen. So tell us a little bit about moon painting. I had been doing a lot of drawings of landscapes um, at the time uh, in circles. And this was, you know, an experiment in doing that same landscape drawing, line drawings, uh, but with the horse hair. Well, it's amazing what you've been able to pull off here too. It's so hard to even comprehend how you've done this fine work, even on this detailing. So you were able to sort of thread in Mm -hmm. So this one's made, well, all of the paintings that we've seen actually are all made single strand by single strand that I sew in and then somehow tie off on the back side of it. But this one was made uh, similarly where it's sewn on one side and then looped and tightened through the other side. Um, so, so far with my work in this process, I've had some scale restrictions, but um, I hope that I can start going a little bit bigger and playing with this idea more um, and keeping the tension in it. I think that's really, for me, very interesting, the tension um, in the horse hair and really flattening it out more mm -hmm. similar to like a, a drawing, a sculptural drawing material. I love that. How big do you think you could take it? I think I could go up to... I don't know, 40, maybe 50 centimeters. It's difficult finding hair that long. Most of the, the hair on the horse's tails is shorter because the, the spine does go down so far. Um, but sometimes you, I get some tails uh, that are really beautiful and long and I keep them special for projects like, like, the, like the paintings. Mm -hmm. well, that's great. So this piece, Tip, um, Again, I think it's one of those stunning showstoppers that really makes people wonder like how you did this and how you brought these elements together. So talk to us a bit about how TIP was created. Yeah, I mean, this one was really inspired by femininity and sort of youth, youthfulness, youthful femininity. I have the vessel that sort of acts like a cinched waist or maybe an hourglass to sort of accentuate the form and it's almost like a ponytail hair. And I dyed it again pink with the hibiscus um, because I love the color and I'm, I'm pretty interested in hibiscus in general, um, both for the, the dyes, for its edibility, the flower's beautiful, you know, for the symbolism. Yeah, it's a great flower and incredible ways of using it. When I look at this piece too, I feel like I may be projecting, but I feel like we get a little bit of your like Albertan, maybe Western Canada prayer girl sensibility. I feel like there's some, you know, some sheaves of wheat perhaps yeah. that could be seen in this. Absolutely. In that top part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think we talked think... about that too, like sort of the, the landscape, the Canadian landscape sometimes finds its way into your work. Yeah, especially the prairies. You know, I spend a lot of time in the mountains, but I think there's something so beautiful about the prairies. It's really a, a special place. And time and time again, it ends up in my work in some way. And I, I wonder if that's the more, the emphasis on line, perhaps, um, that happens sort of in a prairie landscape. It's much easier to make that connection. Um, and line is really important in, in all my pieces, or it seems to be this reoccurring theme in the work that I do, mm -hmm. sculpturally and two-dimensionally. It was very appealing. Um, yeah, and also I just see a, a wonderful side pony when I look at this. It's like cute and sassy. 
So cute and sassy. <laughs> I have a couple daughters and I, I look at this and I think about doing hair. Um, Great. Well, it does have that beautiful <laughs> quality that you talk about for sure. There's just kind of a, an energy to it, which is amazing. It's just, it's that flow of the line, right? That gesture that gets us yeah. to that place. Um, this, like weight of line that has an association to the body and also that we can relate to on some sort of emotional level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that one. Um, mm. Oh yeah, this is a, this is a terrific one. Um, I feel like this is one of the first ones seeing your work that I felt like I personally connected with. Like, I want to know more about what's going on here. So um, a lot of the works that we're showing are quite recent. This one's from 2019, which isn't that long ago, but I feel like your, uh, your output and your production, I think is quite, you, you move quickly. I think you make a lot of things when we were working on the show. Every time we would connect or have a Zoom call, you would have some new thing to show me. And I was so impressed because you just had all these ideas and you were getting them done and, and making new things. So something from 2019 might seem kind of older, I suspect, within uh, your practice. And also that this one does seem a little bit different than some of the other works. The glass uh, has color to it. Again, we see the use of pink um, mm -hmm. and the braid, which I don't think... I don't think is in any of the other works in the show. Correct me if I'm wrong. You are correct. There, I don't think there are any other braids, but stay tuned. I've got something killer that I've been working on for six months. Um, so this one, yeah, this was kind of the first time that I used pink, which it sounds crazy, but was like intimidating. Uh, mm -hmm. Previously, a lot of my glass work was very monochromatic or clear. I really like clear glass. I like glass. Um, in all its transparent glory, I think. And so that was a little bit intimidated work, intimidating um, working with a color. I think also because it's such a bold color, it really not just makes a statement, but like it, it and makes an impression. It tells more of a story, I think. Um, and I think a lot of my previous work, I was kind of still trying to keep the story to myself and not let people in on too much of it. Um, so I loved working uh, with the braid. It looks rad. I don't know. <laughs> it does look it's so rad. cool. <laughs> and I think a lot like the last one too, sort of the, the use of the color, the use of the braiding, having that emotional response that people can have from, um, learning to braid and when you learn to braid and that action, it's a, you know, it's a craft action in itself, right? You've learned this new skill. Often as a young, a young person, someone will show you how to do this and you practice on hair, you practice on your doll's hair, what have you. Um, yeah. And you need a clip. Maybe it's a beautiful pink clip. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's a really something here. And then the title of the work like, too, Isn't She Pretty, always has that evocative feeling whenever I see the title I'm like oh, okay yes I, I feel like I'm walking down the road with you on a certain idea here mm -hmm. yeah uh, I guess I'm doing some part of my job right then yeah. I think you know when I think about braids I think of my father my father used to braid my hair when I was young mm -hmm. so I think it's also charged with these other meanings and all the titles, like you mentioned, have this little thread to get to, you know, the title mixed with the blonde braid mixed with the pink um, definitely makes me think of certain nostalgic things. Yeah, so I think this was the first like horsehair piece that I really made where the horsehair wasn't supposed to look like a horse's mane. Mm. Um, when I was manipulating it sculpturally, I was working with copper a lot with the glass threads. Um, and I thought it was the perfect opportunity. And so, so with the other pieces and she pretty, I made it and I was like, oh yeah, that's got some things going on. Like, look at these, these great things. It's pill shaped, it's blonde and pink. It's so cute. And then I sort of made this and I was like, oh, it's so hairy and vaginal and copper and witchy. And that's really great too. It was like, um, a shape that seems to come up a lot in my works, this oval shape or elongated circular shape, almost diamond shape comes up in 
it's definitely a reoccurring uh, form in my pieces. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the glass threads that lent itself to coming to work with the horsehair. Do you ever work with the glass threads anymore if you set that aside mm -hmm. for now? No, I work with the glass thread still when I can get hot shop time. Um, I have an exhibition coming up at the Glass Museet Ebeltoft in Denmark that's going to be opening in June uh, for that work. And I've been working towards that show since 2018. So that's really exciting for me. And I think it's going to be an interesting show, especially because it's really going to show this evolution that's happened over three years of the same themed work. Oh, oh polish. So cute. So cute. <laughs> I think when it came in and we unwrapped it, I think we all were kind of like, oh, we all want to put our hands on it because it's just that right hand shaped size. And immediately everyone's saying what it reminds them of, right? Is it a mushroom? Is it a scrub brush? What is it? We're all like, we all kind of want to yeah enter that fantasy world where this tool or this character or whatever it is is used um and it's so simple right you have your blown glass top and your horsehair bottom and yeah it's just this perfect little object yes I think you know one shouldn't have favorites but this is one of my more favorite pieces um that I've made recently and I think it's the ambiguity of it. And, but it's also supercharged with so many like exotic ideas, I think, you know, is it, it's a creature maybe, or like you said, it's a tool. It's maybe a, I was thinking like a nail brush or a jellyfish or a mushroom. And then people were saying like, it's a beard brush, which was kind of the opposite idea of what I thought, you know, I was thinking, of women's women's things, women's work, scrubbing, cleaning your nails, those sort of things, hair, I guess, in this form is kind of more feminine. Um, and originally, actually, the piece was a complete accident that turned into, you know, just ended up being something that was perfect, I guess, <laughs> for what it was. I think it's such an interesting piece too, because it sort of speaks to to uh, the materiality of the horsehair in a different way than I think any of the other pieces do in that the horsehair stands, it holds up the piece. It's not just this cascading, beautiful um, threads that seem very you know, soft and pliable. In this case, it's strong enough to hold up the little glass top. And I don't think we see that in any of the other works. Right. It has like a more utilitarian and purpose as well. Uh -huh. And again, so, so small. It's one of those ones, if you saw it across the room, you might not know exactly what it was, but yeah, you really want to get up close to that one and get a good look at it. Um, yeah, I'm not supposed to have favorites either, but I think whenever we <laughs> about it, when we were installing, it was kind of, kind of an instant favorite. So a wonderful piece and yeah, so it's so familiar. And yet like, I've never seen anyone make that before. No, it was, um some shapes. I was just making shapes in the hot shop um, and decided to put some horse hair in it. This was, I don't want to get else, but Neil, my husband, was making a lot of monsters at the time. He's also sculpts, dabbles in sculpting. And um, I started getting a little farther out of my wheelhouse in these references to the human body and the landscape and becoming, I think with polish as well, like a little bit more freer to see what the piece would end up as, like if it could inhabit a different world that wasn't like just Carissa land. Maybe this is like the forest outside of Carissa land where these sort of creatures hang out, whatever this curly cue is. Um, that maybe is like a snake standing straight up. It's definitely got itself like a little tail there. Mm -hmm. um, and the glass is as well as hand is hand polished, um, which I think kind of adds to like this allure to the piece. I often in my other glass work do a lot of uh, hand polishing, but I don't want to say that now because looking at this exhibition, there's not that much that's hand polished. <laughs> so, and I think it gives like this real interesting sheen to the glass and like a velvety quality that I think 
sort of reverberates through the piece and into the the hair as well. Mm -hmm. When you look at this or when you're making this, do you think about it as a, a glass piece that the horse hair is helping to emphasize the glass or is it about bringing forward the horse hair and using the glass to form it? Do you know uh, what I mean? Yeah, I think like for this one, the one couldn't be without the other one. And I will say like in this specific piece, I definitely had no clue that this is how it was gonna turn out. For a lot of the stuff while I'm working on it, you know, I'm leaving open the possibilities of like, cutting the top, straightening the bottom, making it raw. You know, sometimes I like the idea of the horse hair looking hairy and raw. And then other times like with polish or the top of this one, I want it to be this other thing where it's maybe more industrial or a little bit stricter and firmer than what horse hair would generally offer me. Um, so I think like the black definitely highlights the beauty of the glass, the horse hair, but of course the horse hair couldn't be imagined. I can't imagine it in this position without the glass. So I think that this is one where they kind of sort of work together, whereas other ones, maybe like tip is something where I'm using the glass as the waste of the hair. The hair is the show, you know. It's a good answer. <laughs> okay, we had a, new, a next slide that came out. Oh, here it is, Spettle. Oh yes, this one too was also a favorite um, as we were installing it because to take it out, it sort of looks one way. And then once it was on the wall and it had this beautiful um, flow to it, uh, as we see here, it's not pulled taut. And that was part of your instructions. Um, and that all being part of the sculptural quality. And the, again, the line, we see this beautiful lyrical line coming out of it mm. um, and being named Settle. And, I, and what does that mean? It really gets <laughs> working. Tell us about this one. Yeah, this one is definitely a, a landscape piece for me. It really referenced the prairies um, and, and horses and also perhaps like a, a body as well as how it's, you know, settled into itself, how a house settles, you know, I think just the verb to settle, you know, has a lot of different meanings. I think a lot of my pieces are, are verbalicious in this exhibition, so. Yeah, well, naming it former, I feel like that really set the tone, <laughs> right? When you, when you landed on that title and the use of the parentheses too, which sort of allowed a movement and shifting on what, what you were getting at. What is, what do you mean by former? Are you forming? Is it in the past? Um, are you the former? All these things that we can think about, about the form itself. It seems so applicable. And again, it really drives the audience to go further and think about what you're making and why you're making it, what that backstory is and to uh, propel their imaginations forward, I think. So. I think I was also <laughs> <Very malicious. laughs> I think I was also being a little bit selfish with the name too because something that I struggle with is that I'm a maker to be a maker I want to art for art's sake take it however you may that that sentence so you know I think this was sort of an excuse to make an exhibition or focus my works on even though all of them seem to be so autobiographical and have so much content behind them, but to make this exhibition that seemed much more formal, that could really, I don't wanna say excuse itself, but just could exist as these forms, as what they are, as they're perceived on the wall as that. Mm -hmm. It's refreshing, I think. We don't often get that chance just to appreciate, yeah, the form, the materiality, the construction, the craft work. There is often, a demand, uh, you know, by curators and writers such as myself to to go deeper to explore those things, but uh, yeah, I think this work um, can exist in all sorts of different levels, and I'm I'm so thankful for that. Um, this one, I was like thinking about my mother a lot, mm. um, and you know, again about this femininity and our life cycle and sort of value on different seasons of womanhood and what our roles are as females 
um, in these different seasons. So I used the glass, I think maybe this is one that even though the hair is bigger, the glass for me is really important as this like cone or funnel to a point where things a little get, get a little more mixed together, but still st say, still stay firmly separate. It makes me think about like a, a flower bouquet of holding. And again, the hand seems to, to really come to mind right away too. Because the scale of this is about this, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, and so with the glass, I was... With the glass, I was also thinking a lot about like cosmetic tubes and toothpaste tubes and those sort of things, you know, mm -hmm. and sort of what's in and what comes out and the purpose of whatever comes out. Oh, curve. Yeah. Yeah. So, so sassy. Again, that shape that you've played with a few times, this kind of arc shape, but taking it in a totally different direction. Yeah. This one was interesting for me um, because the glass uh, is so fine comparative to some of the other glass pieces, or maybe it's the scale of the glass, you know, in correlation to the hair, it's quite similar, but the hair became very unhairy, uh, much to my surprise. It almost seems to me like uh, nylon or something because the glass is so mm -hmm. shiny and with the hair short and cut, it almost sort of took the hairiness out of it. Yeah, I can see that. Oh, that is interesting that the relationship between the two has shifted. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't have that free flowingness at the bottom with that blunter cut. And mm -hmm. it is so dark. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like a synthetic or man-made material to me, sort of, now that it's a as a finished piece. Uh, so that's another interesting play that happened, you know, with the material that was unexpected, sort of two shiny things together changing, you know, the, how the hair turned out and really maybe removing some of the natural coarseness and embedding it with a very man-made like shininess to it. Mm. And you were saying earlier, so often when you are um, doing your blown glass, you're making the form and you're, do you know ahead of time what kind of horsehair you want to put it in or do you have the form no. and then you're playing? Mostly. Um, sometimes I have crazy ideas and dreams and I go into the hot shop and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm going to make all of these, all these pink curly things. It's going to be great. One of them's going to be good. Um, and then sometimes I just sort of like have, as you mentioned before, something more lyrical in mind. And I think I'm just going to have this, this stock of glass. Um, but it does happen from time to time when I do have hot shop time that I can kind of align that with some horse hair making time and um, have specific ideas in mind. And often it does happen that, you know, I'll make something just playing around in the hot shop and a couple of weeks later, you know, I'll, I can have the opportunity to go back and look at that and realize that I was kind of onto something there and develop that further. And whether that makes it to a finished piece, you know, is another thing. Ah. Cruella. Hmm. which uh, that streak of white against the black and the name, of course, gets us all thinking about 101 Dalmatians, but I'm sure there is so much more to this piece than that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm glad, I, of course, with that name, how could it not maybe? 101 Dalmatians was my brother's favorite movie when he was little. And I, you know, had a, had a dream where I was thinking a lot about this certain era of our lives. Um, and that's how this piece came about. Um, and I was also thinking a lot about like skunks in the summer, having this really nostalgic period of, you know, hot summer nights, driving in the car, riding your bike on the pavement, you know, and it's black tarmac with a white stripe on it. Mm. All these things, things again, together, things coming apart, re-emerging, intertwining. 
And the glass on this piece, again, is a little bit different um, than we've seen. I don't know, I don't think we've seen black uh, glass mm -hmm. in any other piece. And even the way that you have formed this one where it's sort of the two open uh, sections on the side and then kind of flat or together in the middle. Um, yeah, so uh, I sort of put these together late on in the process. Uh, this glass is actually from 2020 when I was making, I was trying to make a lot of things that would keep things apart. So I was making cylinders that I would uh, kiln form after to try to make two separate parts to them. And the idea was that I was going to have the glass always like going outward. Same, similar ideas perhaps to between both that we looked at before, these things growing apart from each other or things pulling together. Um, and then it was only later after I had this dream that I started thinking about this piece differently. Um, and Cru Cruella came, came to be. Thinking about this mm -hmm. one uh, and then the, the last one with the um, black horsehair coming through and it looking um, more synthetic and less natural. Something about this glass to me also has that quality where it starts to seem more like PVC or uh, rubber or something. Rubber. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, and that's like this other interesting that came about in the process of doing it where I didn't have that intention. I think, you know, when I first made the black glass, it was really to make a bold statement visually, if nothing else, you know, black glass is so shiny and beautiful. It's hard to look away. And then in combination with these other materials, it did become this other thing, maybe like a flat tire or a piece of vinyl, something, something very non-glass like. Mm -hmm. and, and so even it's interesting to have that like material jump when it happens unexpectedly as well. Yeah. And looking at it in person, it feels like if you touched it, it wouldn't have that hard glass feel. It seems like it would almost be soft or pliable and that you're able to achieve that is um, amazing. Thank you. <laughs> and I feel like it's, you can perceive that, I think, even through these images, hopefully. Um, I think so. Um, so this piece, you know, when we first uh, were talking about the show and we were looking at this piece and, you know, we'd have Zoom calls between Iceland and Canada and you would show me works and I would kind of get a sense of scale. This one I always imagined to be quite small and it's not, it's, it's fairly large. So when I would see this, I would think, oh, it's like a paintbrush. Uh, and then when we saw it in person, we were all like, this is like, a magic wand or yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally it's like a magic wand broomstick calligraphy paintbrush for conjuring up the magic maybe mm -hmm. I was thinking a lot about well this was um when I was still using copper quite a bit uh, in glass work as well and this is lead crystal on the top and the horse hair on the bottom and I think all of those materials are really have some place in perhaps like alchemy and witchcraft and these other sort of ways of understanding and ulterior knowledge systems. Um, so I was interested in making something that could somehow reference all of that and maybe none of it because I also really was intrigued by making something that seems super formalist of like three portions of three different colors in three different materials. Mm hmm. Yeah, there is the balance of the three of them working out, isn't there? Um, it's so interesting, too, to think about like the, the crystal and the copper, you know, obviously so rigid and so hard. And this horsehair on this one also seems so soft. Like, yeah, I just want to um, use it to like that action of like the magic wand, but also of, like dusting or gently sweeping <laughs> something away. Um, what is that Sorcerer's Apprentice with Mickey Mouse where the the mops and the, everything they work themselves? Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, and they're they're like life-sized. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, and again, to think about form too and the form of this one being um, so slender and so slight and uh, hopefully folks can come and see it 
uh, in person, but for folks that are watching this that aren't in Winnipeg, we ended up um, installing it on a pillar. Um, the gallery is in an older building with um, sort of some pillars right in the middle of the gallery space. And it sort of seems to relate nicely to that tall slender shape. But at the same time, you know, you could probably walk past it the first time and maybe not see it and then come around and realize like, oh, there's this wonderful piece right here sort of floating in front of all the other ones. So there's a, a sort of a mystical quality there as well. Hopefully. I, th I okay. think like with lead crystal, it looks a lot to me in a material point of view, like salt. It doesn't have the same quality glass and polished as well. It gives this really sort of ephemeral glowing feel to it. Um, that glass perhaps has not the that I can stir, so. Again, it's at the Shirley Richardson Craft Gallery at the Manitoba Craft Council. The exhibition is on from now until June 26, 2021. Um, and if anyone wants to find out more information about you, Carissa, where can they go to learn more about you? Yeah, you can find me on my website, carissabacte.com, or on Instagram, carissabacte, or the worldwide web, any Google me, Carissa Bacte. <laughs> well, thank you so much for being with me, Carissa, and thanks thank to everyone you. for listening. We'll sign up there and uh, wish everyone a great day. Take care.